I'm going to talk about the behavioral characteristics of all of the MPS disorders, but with particular attention to MPS2. So research shows us that serious behavioral disturbances are often reported where there's severely affected males in MPS2. And the behaviors include hyperactivity, obstinacy, aggression, and exuberance have been very excitable. And what this group also found was that those children who were less severely affected didn't really show any behavioral disturbance apart from those that were associated with having to come to terms with having a condition such as MPS2. So more anxiety, depression. More recent research um, in a retrospective study of 50 males with MPS2 has highlighted that just over half of them showed signs of hyperactivity. At the, the mean age was about four years of age. <coughs> Almost half of them had aggressive behaviors. Again, the mean age was just over four years of age. And 19% had underactivity, and this was as the disease process progressed, the children tended to show less um, active behavior. Behavior can also be a, an indicator of CNS involvement. Seven early behavioral markers have been identified as being associated with CNS involvement. And these include sleep disturbance, overactivity, behavioral difficulties as in acting out, not doing as asked, perseverative chewing, a lot of children with MPS2 engage in, in uh, a lot of chewing behavior, a lot of chewing of the fingers, a lot of oral fixation, and seizure-like behavior. We know from this early study, almost two-thirds of the children in this study had sleep disturbance in MPS2. And, and in fact, um, it has been thought that sleep disturbance is also apparent in MPS3 and is linked to behavior. Now, we know this from working with children with ADHD, that um, slight chicken and egg, but the less sleep that they get at night, the more active, the more hyperactive they tend to be. And I suspect there may be a similar link here. Well, we've learned that children with severe MPS 2 and 3 dis um, display behaviors such as hyperactivity, aggression, hyperorality, and no sense of fear. And there's been the suggestion of autistic-like traits. So although they wouldn't characteristically fit into a true diagnosis of autism, some of the behaviors do represent that. They often hallmark the onset of neurological changes. Sleep disturbance seems to be the number one factor in more impaired patients. I've seen the hyperactivity. Children run around, um, very, very, uh, get very excited about the smallest of things. So it's really important as we come on to see to make sure that the environment the children are in is quite low in stimulation because it tends to act as a catalyst for some of their behaviors. We do see excessive chewing behavior in the more impaired children, so chewing of fingers, chewing of clothes, chewing of all of my test materials when I um, do an assessment. Everything seems to be um, drawn to the mouth. Um, I've also observed that in, in contrast to what we might expect, the children with MPS2 actually do seek out social contact. And they are, in my experience, very affectionate little souls, and they uh, will come to give you a hug, but then it can suddenly turn into an aggressive slap or a punch quite unexpectedly, and you don't actually know what's created that um, sudden change in behavior. Um, in the more severe forms of MPS2, we see quite low levels of activity, low levels of engagement. Um, as I say, seeking social contact, but not quite understanding the social rules, not recognizing social space, not recognizing that you don't stare at somebody, not recognizing that you don't touch somebody who you've only just met. As a psychologist, I'm interested in not just defining the behavior, but trying to understand what factors contribute towards it. We would want to be looking at what environmental changes are going on for the child and what, what factors in the environment might be associated with particular behaviors. Internal states such as hunger and pain and fatigue. So children may have toothache, they may have pain in their um, wrist, there may be other pains that they're not able to communicate because they're lacking in uh, expressive language skills. And 
we're relying on clinicians that know the child very well, parents that know the, the child very well to identify those internal states. Other internal states that are psychological in nature would be fear, anxiety, excitement. Not being able to communicate, I think most of us, if we suddenly lost our ability to speak, would get quite frustrated and angry um, with some of the situations we find ourselves in, and probably this is true of, of, of this population of children as well. We've mentioned sleep deprivation. Although seizures happen perhaps a little bit later on in the disease, um, the course of the disease, actually they could be having a direct effect on the child's behaviour. And the effects of medication as well may also be um, manifested in, in behavioural ways, so we need to monitor that as well. Something I've seen quite a lot of um, in the families that we work with is inconsistency of uh, behaviour management between parents. The behaviour gets intermittently reinforced because one parent's always giving in and the other parent's putting the boundaries down. I think as the physical limitations develop, um, children with MPS2 become more and more frustrated. They can't do the things they want to do um, and, and that, that causes them to feel um, angry. Families of children with MPS disorders more generally report that they find the behavioural aspect of the disease disorder harder to manage than the, the physical aspects of it. What we know as well is that um, something like 30 to 40 percent of parents who care for a child with a disability have mental health needs of their own, so depression or anxiety. There have been guidelines more generally about managing MPS too, but not specifically about managing behaviour. There are lots of ways that we might think about managing behaviour. The first and most obvious one is to think about what environmental changes do we need to make to our home to accommodate a child who's acting out or whose behaviour is very aggressive or who's not sleeping well and, and wandering around the house. The next would be perhaps we could treat the biological causes of the behaviour. So if the child's in pain, let's treat the pain. If the child has seizures, let's treat the seizures. Um, let, let's identify what the, the, the trigger is. Um, pharmacological interventions, so drugs that we would ordinarily use in the wider population for anxiety, depression, aggression, could we consider those? Sleep, as we've mentioned before. Behavioural interventions, could, behavior, could therapies or interventions that psychologists and behaviour therapists use in a wide range of settings, could they apply to this population? And parent and family therapies, what can we do to support those families under that stress? Identifying biological factors, um, there may be infections or pain, we need to be alert and vigilant to that. There may be a sudden change in neurological status, so hydrocephalus potentially, or epilepsy, which wasn't there before, is now, and is having quite a, a significant change on the child's behaviour. We need to be aware of what could be causing a sudden change. We need to address sensory issues like hearing, vision, mobility issues, because all of those impact on a child's behaviour. And of course, the sleep issues, in terms of pharmacological interventions, we haven't got any guidelines about this. Um, and I think most people would agree that the use of medication is just one aspect of how we approach behaviour management. There's been no randomised controlled trials with MPS disorders generally, but with MPS2 specifically in terms of what particular medications work with what. What works for one child may not work for another. And equally, what works for one child early on in the, in the disorder may not work for them two or three years later. My impression is that medication is used in a very individualistic way, that clinicians try things. If it doesn't work, they try something else. There doesn't seem to be a sense of an overall um, recommendation about where to start, what to do next. So some of the choices available from within psychiatry more generally, working with um, other populations of children, would include these choices. So anxiolytics for children who have in insomnia or anxiety, antidepressants for children with low mood or anxiety, stimulants for hyperactivity, 
poor attention or impulsivity. Antipsychotic medication, some of the children seem to have apparent um, visual hallucinations in, at times, aggressive episodes, dangerous behaviours. And anticonvulsants, for, obviously for seizures, but for mood swings, for headaches, for um, frustration tolerance. Now, all of these are used in different populations. There's variable successes um, reported by clinician doctors um, in terms of the pharmacological interventions. And the risks versus benefits have to be weighed up in terms of the, in the context of the physical characteristics of MPS2. Because some of the side effects of these drugs might exacerbate problems they already have, like respiratory problems or increased secretions or drowsiness. And do we really want to do that? You know, lots of these drugs rely on um, increasing levels of neurotransmitters such as serotonin. Do we know much about that in MPS2? I haven't been able to identify any papers in the literature that have used behavioural interventions with any of the MPS disorders. What we tend to do as psychologists is apply behaviour analysis. Um, we're focusing on um, the, what behaviour has been demonstrated and how to measure it. We're describing the behaviour in terms of how often it happens, what the intensity of the behaviour is, how long it lasts, and who with or in what, in what situation. And the interventions are based on what we know about social learning principles, and by and large, humans are motivated by reinforcement. So our behaviours are dictated by whether our behaviour gets re reinforced or not. If it does, we're more likely to carry on doing that. If we don't, we tend to stop it. The aim of our interventions is to increase social, socially acceptable behaviours in the children with MPS2, so for them not to be aggressive, etc. We also perhaps want to think about what functions does this behaviour serve for the child? Okay, Helping families cope. Some of the things we might offer is counselling for parents. We might use family therapy um, if there are siblings involved and explore their losses, their expectations of what their child was going to be, um, their hopes. We might think about stress management for parents and lifestyle changes, which might be respite care, or it might be having someone to practically take them to appointments, or having um, a support worker that comes into the house for three mornings a week to give mum or dad a break. Th those would be kind of lifestyle changes that we can help with. We can help them understand what's the function of their child's behaviour. Jointly, try and think about alternative ways that they can work with their child. And I think overwhelmingly it's about helping parents accept, um, well, gradually accept where their child's at. And I think families do have to move from one place to another in terms of the, the decline that they see in their child's condition and a gradual erosion of hope um, that things can get better. To summarise, um, I think caring for a child with MPS2 involves adapting to very unpredictable behavioural symptoms. And we know that this is one of the biggest sources of stress for families, for parents and carers. Um, although behavioural and pharmacological interventions can be helpful, they're not a cure. They're not going to change it all. And helping to reduce the stress in families through therapy interventions and coping strategies, I'd say, is a crucial part of coming to terms with um, having a child with a progressive disorder.